Hey everyone, how's it going? So really excited to be here today. Kayla, how are you? Um, everyone, by the way, feel free to throw a video up if that's an option for you. Um, if not, totally fine and no pressure. Uh, if you have any questions during this, you know, there's so much to cover. If you like, feel free to post in the chat. I'm happy to have a conversation as well, but I'm just really excited to dive into this topic. There is so much to cover and the title does not do it justice. So I'm already seeing the hellos pour in. I love that. I would love to say hello to all of you individually. I don't know if we're going to have time, but I'm going to try and address all questions as they come. Um, so Ruth, Nora, Beth, Amy, hello. Super excited to be here. Very excited to talk about this topic. Um, you know, in my pre writing life, I worked in finance and I, I still do a little bit. I'm more of a marketer these days, but um, love, very passionate about this topic. I think it's so important to understand and know what's happening in your financial life because I think that gives us the flexibility as creatives to do what we do best, and that's create, right? So we're going to dive right in, keep the questions, keep the conversation going. Um, and I'm really excited to, you know, go on this little journey, you know, finance basics for creatives. Er earning, investing, and taxing in taxes. But there's going to be so much more that we cover here. And I'm going to try and condense it all so it fits in an hour. But I've jinxed myself in the past. Um, we'll see what happens. All right. So I, won't, I promise I won't throw up too many slides with pictures of myself. Um, I, won't, I won't be that way. Uh, however, you know, this is from actually my blog where I did a three part series just in the three weeks preceding this um, about earning, investing, and taxes. And this is one of the, the post headers. Um, so if you want more information, I do a deeper dive there. Feel free to check out my blog, George Drage at sub, um, dot, substack com. But, you know, just to get started, let's talk some finance 101. Um, I think that. One thing that they don't obviously teach in college or school or whatever, and we don't really talk about it as a society, is like what is our individual goal with finances? Because your goal may be different than my goal. You know, I might have friends who really want to become wealthy, and that's fine. Um, I tend to shine like the more frugal side, where I just want to live kind of modestly, um, be able to create uh, my art, write my stories, and I'm happy as long as I can do that. Um, so I think understanding yourself and knowing your goals um, is a great place to level set. And it's where you can really build the foundation to determine like, all right, what's my financial future going to look like? And what are the steps I'm going to take to get there? Um, no matter where you are on that spectrum, I'm going to work to give a lowdown so that you know at least a few next steps or you know more than you knew coming in. And if you have questions along the way, feel free to ask if it, if it, you know, pertains to goals, sure. If it pertains to specifics when it comes to finance, it's all on the table. I'm very open in that regard. So diving into finance 101, live below your means, right? Um, you know, the simple equation is earnings minus expenses is what you have left over. And that's what you can live off of. So uh, make sure you keep your expenses as low as possible or your earnings as high as possible if you're fortunate enough to do so. And that's going to put you in a really good place, you know, and that's that's definitely a privilege to be able to get there. Another simple tip, and this is kind of like foundational, is have an emergency fund. So I'm not going to go in too deep into emergency funds when it comes to investing, but this is overarching. Um, try and save, you know, six months expenses to a year of expenses. And when we talk about expenses, it goes back to knowing yourself. Um, what do I spend? What are the things that I'm going to prepare for? Should an emergency come, you know, you lose your job. Um, we enter, you know, a pandemic that we just are, are barely coming out of right now. Um, you know, things happen in life. And so being able to have a runway of, you know, money saved up is going to make a huge difference. The third thing. Um, you know, a lot of these finance tips you're going to see apply to living in America, living in the U.S., because that's just my lived experience. Um, they will apply more broadly, uh, more globally, uh, but generally we're going to keep a focus there. And so one thing in the U.S. that's huge, and I'm sure it's similar across the world, is credit, right? Credit affects everything. And so being able to build credit is going to be foundational for you. Uh, it's going to affect how much, you know, you could take out in terms of a mortgage or a loan what your interest rate 
on that loan maybe um and and so much more um i know that opening bank accounts um folks have done credit checks on me and you know so i i don't necessarily anticipate that but i'm thankful that i have a decent credit so that when i do need a new account a new mortgage um, to open a credit card i'm set so you may be asking how do i build my credit or how do i climb out of you know bad credit um, there is so much there, right? That can be a whole talk in and of itself. But the steps I would take are try and climb out of any debt you have. Credit card debt is the worst kind of debt to have. So uh, pay that off as quick as possible. Um, if you don't have a lot of credit and you haven't really started on that journey yet, open a no-fee credit card. So any credit card that does not charge an annual fee, there are some that charge um, pretty high fees, you know, 100 bucks a month, 200 bucks a month. Um, I know one that charges $550 a month. So steer away from those as you're getting started. Um, start with a no fee credit card and just start putting money on it. Um, you know, paying things with that credit card and paying off that credit card right away. Um, that kind of builds us into our next foundational thing, which is not to take on too much debt. Again, credit card debt is the worst debt, but there is, you know, uh, if you if you take out if you buy a brand new sports car, right? you take out a loan on that so you pay it off monthly um, that can be debt that's not necessary and it can hurt your financial future so just understand like what is important for you um, and and I'm seeing uh, Ruth say you're from the UK yeah I, you know I think a lot of this stuff is gonna apply to you um, especially not taking on too much debt however there is a flip side to that and we'll talk about it with, with, with investing because there is debt that can obviously help you get to a better place financially and that's maybe a bit more advanced, but making sure that you're diligent about that and you're tracking. I know a lot of folks use a budget. Um, I've used a budget in the past. Right now I'm at a place where I understand my finances to a degree that I don't need a budget. Um, but if, you, if you're if you not sure what you spend on maybe a monthly ba basis, make sure you have a budget or at least track your expenses so you understand what those are. And that'll help inform again, kind of what your plan is moving forward, whether that's with an emergency fund whether that's kind of determining how much do I need to earn in a given period of time. Um, but understanding these four basics are going to give you a really solid foundation to move on to the other things that we're going to talk about in this presentation. So moving on here, I'm going to go into just a few credit and debt no-nos just to get us into like a deeper layer here. Um, and there are reasons for all of these, and it's not just opinion. This is this comes from kind of data and, uh, and facts. So do not max out your credit card. You know, some of us might open a credit card account, and they're like, "Well, you got ten thousand dollars to spend. Do not spend ten thousand dollars on that credit card at one time. Um, that's actually going to ding your credit score and bring it down." Um, there's something called utilization when it comes to credit, and what that means is the degree to which you need to use your credit. So if you're using like 10%, 20% of your credit and paying it off immediately, you're good. You're solid. If you're using like 70, 80%, that would be a red flag. And they may be a little more hesitant to give you more credit card accounts because they're like, we don't want this person going too far into the hole. Um, that may be bad. Then they have to go bankrupt or default on their credit. And that would be bad for us as credit card lenders. So make sure you're not maxing out your credit card. Um, kind of use uh, your discretion with that and, and maybe... You know, use credit cards when you need to, but don't go overboard there. Um, definitely avoid paying any debt late. We talked about credit card debt. Um, that tends to have the highest interest that you have to pay um, if you're late. So like 15 to 20%, something like that. And that really adds up. Uh, it can be really easy to make a big purchase and say, hey, I only have to pay $30 installments. Well, that is how the credit card company ropes you in for years and years and years uh, paying that kind of debt. Student debt is also really notorious for that, um, where it kind of accrues really quickly. And so it's another kind of form of debt that you want to pay off quickly. Um, car loans, mortgage are debts that you can take out, again, for a longer term. And the interest rates tend to be lower. However, if you accrue too much debt, um, that can be bad, especially if you find yourself in a place where, oh, I don't have an income anymore. I lost my job due to a pandemic. Just to give an example, that's a bad place to be even if you had a manageable debt to start with. So um, if you can't pay off a debt that you have, contact the lender right away. That should be your first step. Um, 
another step is to kind of determine, okay, what are my debts? How can I make an action plan such that I earn enough money just to pay off those debts? So I'm at least at a break even point and go from there. High interest debt, like credit card debt, student loan debt, are things that you want to avoid um, as much as you can. But there are often times where you can't negotiate those debts. They're just kind of set in standard. However, there are times where you can negotiate debt. Um, for example, a mortgage. A lot of us want to buy houses. We're probably in one of the hottest housing markets there is right now. Um, you can shop around and be sure to shop around for the best rates. Go to different mortgage brokers. Uh, go to different companies and say like, hey, this is what this person's giving me. Like, can you beat this? Um, that's a fair thing to do. It can be uncomfortable, but it will set you up to save a lot of money in the future. Um, there are, you know, short-term loans that you can take out. I would avoid those altogether if you can help it. Um, rely on your emergency fund instead. You know, that's what it's there for. Um, should you have a necessity? Um, should you have uh, a debt that needs to be paid off right away? Um, that is the value of having an emergency fund. Um, those short-term loans tend to carry high interest rates, and you're, you know, what you might take out a loan for a thousand dollars for, you'll end up paying fifteen hundred dollars for. And that's how that's how they get you. That's how these companies make money. So being smart about that and understanding like, okay, well, I can get a short-term loan. What are the drawbacks of taking out those short-term loans? What are the drawbacks of taking out those high um, interest credit cards? That will set you up to make better decisions moving forward. We're going to get progressively more savvy and, and technical as we move forward in the seminar. But I think understanding this and being disciplined about our spending and the debts we take on is, is like, baseline for everybody and I, I honestly wish that they taught it in schools they don't um but this will help frame everything else that i'm going to talk about so if there are no questions about that we're going to continue to move forward um feel free to drop questions again in the chat that's where i'm looking not so much the q a so part one we're going to be talking about earning i think that this is probably the topic that i can talk the most about because there's just so much to say and it's so subjective, you know, careers, um, you know, different, different paths, different, different job titles, um, how much income you make, where you work, what you do. Uh, there's, there's, it's so layered and there's so much nuance here that we can fall into the trap of losing, um, you know, the forest for the trees. And I think that, um, we're gonna keep focused here, but if you at any point want to steer the conversation in a certain direction and or wanna learn more about a topic, feel free to suggest that. We can go there. And if I don't have an answer right away, I'll get one for you. But you know, I'm excited to talk about this. So let's let's talk about creative careers. So there are two forms of creative careers. And and generally speaking, there are two forms, you can drop creative from there. There are two forms of careers right? Salaried or freelance. A salaried employee is someone typically who works for a company. Um, you know, I have a day job and I work for um, a Fortune 100 company and that's a pretty big company. That's all that means. And I collect a salary. So I have a steady paycheck. It does, it's not variable. Um, and I, every couple of weeks, I know exactly what I'm going to make. That's what a salaried employee is. You have fixed income. Um, typically, you get benefits, hopefully, right? Um, that includes medical insurance, that includes, um, you know, retirement plan accounts, which can be really great. And we'll talk about investing. Um, and that includes other things like gym memberships and stuff like that. You know, companies try to incentivize folks to work for them because companies want to retain their talent, especially that's another thing right now. We're in a hot housing market, but we're in a really hot talent market as well, where companies are really competing. So the salaried route is a lucrative one potentially. Um, and it's typically more consistent. It's a safer bet, you know what you're gonna make. And so there's a lot more comfort associated with it. However, there are drawbacks to the structure as there are to anything. And um, going into this salaried route um, may lend itself to a corporate career. So working for a company, you're gonna have to give in to like their policies, their structures, and that's not always fun. And that definitely doesn't always mesh with how a creative person thinks. I know I find myself sometimes struggling 
when I have to kind of go up a chain of command and I'm just like, why can't I just skip this and go straight to the top? Well, there are policies and procedures in place and it's just how things are done. And being able to follow those rules will lend itself to a corporate career more so than a creative person may like because we like to find creative solutions and ways to do things. Um, now, a freelancer, that's a whole different ball game, right? A freelancer does not have a set income. You may know exactly what you're going to charge, um, but that all that means is you essentially take jobs on your own. You are your own business. Me, George Rage, I'm a freelancer. I do editing services sometimes. Um, I don't know how much in terms of clientele, how much in terms of income I'm going to collect from a monthly basis. Um, so it's a little more variable, and that's that's scary, right? Not a lot of us can afford to go down that route because we might have families, we might have dependents that need us to, um, you know, provide income for. Um, we may have other debts, you know, student debt or other expenses from month to month. So it's a little more difficult to be a freelancer. You know, all authors, when it comes to publishing contracts, are looked at as freelancers. We don't form companies and make agreements with publishers. Um, all agents are, you know, generally freelancers as well. So um, we're really, a lot of folks are out there in the creative side of things trying to make an income and it's difficult and they're struggling um, because it's not easy. However, you have total freedom, uh, you know, with corporate as a salaried employee, um, I have to be at the office, you know, office, I work remotely, but um, metaphorically speaking, I have to be in, um, logged in and working at a certain point of time and I get to, you know, check out at a certain point in time. Um, however, with freelance, I can, you know, start working at 12 a.m., you know, midnight, and then stop working at 5 a.m., or I can start working a regular, you know, nine to five if I want to, but the choice is mine, and having that freedom is really, fr like, it's really nice. Um, it's, it's hard um, to do it in a way that is sustainable, um, unless you're really judicious about determining what your expenses are, what you need to make, and becoming good at that niche. And so I think that there are routes that being a freelancer can be even more lucrative than a corporate career, but it takes a lot of hard work initially. Um, so just understand that, yes, freedom sounds fantastic, but it comes at a cost. And if you're willing to work towards it and pay that cost, um, it you know that's typically the route that I think befits most creators, to be honest. So it's really interesting to explore um, you know, obviously I'm an author, I'm not an illustrator or something like that. So I think of things in terms of publishing, but to explore how different creative careers fit into those bubbles. And so we'll go into more of that in the next slide. Cause I want to analyze, I like to use myself as an, as an example. You'll, you'll find this. Um, so I want to talk about my income streams and, um, I'll give real life examples with when it comes to freelance and, and salaried. So, my day job is in marketing, as I mentioned previously. I collect a paycheck every other week. I like it because it gives me a little bit of creativity. Um, so it kind of lends itself to that. I can use my strengths when it comes to writing, when it comes to critical thinking to do well in my job. Um, and it's that's, that's kind of what I want in a salary career. That's what I want in any form of career. So um, if you're thinking of going into a creative career, marketing may be the spot for you. Um, but that's what I do for my salary job because that gives me the consistency. I know that I have certain bills that I have to pay each month and I have to make enough money to pay those bills. Um, so I do that. Now, freelance book editing is another thing I do to supplement that income. I think that a lot of individuals, especially in our day and age, um, maybe they don't make enough in their day jobs or maybe they just want to make more money so they can pay for additional expenses so they can justify, you know, bigger purchases so they can save more money. Um, and so I do some freelance book editing and, um, you know, it's really rewarding. I love working with authors. I love working with books and I can do it whenever I want. If I want to just work on the weekends, I can just work on the weekends. If I want to do it after a day job, you know, I can do that as well. So it's really great. Another income stream, and this is the most variable by far, is um, you know writing books. 
um, you know, I've written um, a, a full length novel and I've also written a short story, both um, that have paid me and, and paid me pretty well. You know, um, I will talk more about like book deals and contracts and whatnot towards the end of the presentation. That's kind of like the dessert if this is the main meal, because that's really fun to talk about, at least in my opinion. But um, I'm a creative and I was able to sell my book to a big publisher, um, which is hugely rewarding, but also um, it paid a pretty great advance. And that is an income stream. And I say it's highly variable because I can't always guarantee I'm going to be selling books. Now, if you sell a book and it does really well, well, that can carry you over in terms of um, income for a very long time. But, you know, for most of us authors, we make just enough to get by. So this book deal will definitely be a great supplement to my income, but I would not, knowing my expenses, rely on it, you know, every year. The other thing is uh, real estate. You know, this is not something that I talk about, but, um, you know, I will talk about more talk about it more when it comes to investing. Um, but I do have a condo and I do. Um, so technically I'm a real estate advisor I, uh, or investor because I own real estate. And currently due to the pandemic, I've moved back home. Um, and that's allowed me to rent out that piece of real estate and make an income. You know, it's, it's small. It's not, it's not a lot, but it's something and it helps pay, you know, the bills. So um, as we, you know, talk about, investing get into that world um just know that there are options to make more money um you know with the money you already have and i like that that is my income stream because um at least in the states we you know make folks sign a contract what we call a lease and we know how much we're going to make each month um and and so it's it's pretty predictable income it's passive i don't work a lot doing it and so i can do it on top of my day job and my writing and my editing um, so that's that's a nice little additional income stream. So so all in all, I have four income streams, and um, I recommend you know trying to diversify uh, your income streams because that lets you you know say I lose my job in marketing. Well, I have three other things that I can sort of rely on to get by. Um, if I don't get a book deal for a few years, uh, which is totally normal, um, I can rely on the other things to at least keep me uh, financially stable. So that's that's my personal journey. Obviously, everyone differs um, on a case by case basis, but I think understanding that and seeing examples in real life, um, and me being honest, you know, about you know what I do and what I make, I you know, and all this adds up to like about six figures, and then that's pretty solid income, and I'm, I'm very privileged in that regard. But I've worked very hard to slowly build those, and I don't think you can do it all at once. But you know, you start somewhere, and you slowly. Uh, enter into other income streams as you become more comfortable um, and you can get somewhere um, where you have multiple um, streams of revenue coming in at once. It's a, it's a, and it's a pretty comfortable situation in that regard. All right. I said, we're going to talk about book deals and contracts later, but I did want to break down my personal book deal since I'm already talking about myself. So, um, you know, this is going to lend itself a lot to um, what I, what I discuss in terms of getting an agent and getting an editor. Um, obviously, if you're an illustrator, if you work in another creative field um, other than writing, this may not necessarily apply to you, but it may be very beneficial to learn about how I make money um, from books and how I can earn in that regard. Um, there are other writers who rely just primarily on books, and that is a dream. You know, a lot of us would love to do that, and I think that. Uh, working towards that goal is a really noble one. So uh, my book deal uh, was a six-figure deal for two books with HarperCollins. And um, what that meant was they gave me um, six figures spread across um, my deliverables. So I had deadlines to meet. Uh, you often hear writers talking about, oh, I have deadline. Like, this is what it means. Um, and once I met those deadlines, I would get, you know, part of that uh, advance. So um, I received half upon signing that contract, and then I will receive the other half broken up into two parts upon the delivery of each book. I sold those for World English Rights. So what that means is that I can sell uh, my book in other markets that 
uh, translate to languages other than English. So I can sell my book to the Japanese book market and have it translated to Japan and get an additional advance from that. Um, you know, Arabic, Spanish, um, any other language really, um, I can sell because it's a world English rights book. Um, I have a bonus clause that if I sell a certain amount of books, I get a bonus. You know, it's not easy to, to, to reach those, um, you know, thresholds, but I think that the publisher's intention is to give the author something to work towards, to market themselves towards. Like, I look at everything I do, um, every interaction as a genuine one, and that's what my goal. But, you know, in a way, you're selling yourself with everything um, that you participate in because you are your own brand. And I think that creatives need to look at themselves as their own brand. And, um, you know, if, 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 if you say, hey, I like that talk that George gave, I'm going to buy one of his books. Um, that, I think, is what the publisher wants to encourage. Amy asked, um, are bonus clauses common? Um, you know, I don't think they're necessarily common. I think that big publishers who have more discretionary uh, funds to provide may toss those in. So I think it's really a privilege more so than um, kind of a standard. However, again, it's a really hard threshold. Selling $45,000 worth of books, for example, that's that's a lot of books you have to sell, and uh, most don't reach that point. So um, it's just something that I keep in the back of my head um, and that I know exists, but I don't give it all that much thought. You know, my goal is just, you know, whatever sells, whoever gets to enjoy a book, I'm just happy to, that I have a book deal, to be honest. So um, it's it's a consideration. But Amy, I would I would say that bonus clauses are not necessarily common. What is common are royalties. Hopefully, if you get a book deal that does not have royalties, either you've sold IP, um, and many and a lot of IP intellectual property um, does have royalties as well. Um, but when I say intellectual property, what I mean is like you're writing for Marvel or you're writing for one of these established franchises and they just kind of pay you a fee to write, to write their book. Um, but because my book is original work, um, I get royalties and this only kicks in again once I earn out my advance and being that my advance was um, on the higher side compared to a lot of others, it's going to be hard to earn that advance out. Um, if I'm so fortunate to do so, then my royalties will be six to 25% uh, per book, depending on the medium. And what I say by medium, well, digital properties such as audiobook, um, so they, the advance tends to be higher than for physical properties like hardcover or paperback. Um, so if I can sell six figures worth of books, um, I will be entitled to these royalties, which is, like I said, kind of how some authors can coast. You know, if you if your book does really well, um, they just have this additional income from royalties coming in year after year. And that's pretty great. You know, that's an additional income stream uh, not to be overlooked. It could be pennies. It could be thousands of dollars. Who knows? Um, but it's, that's, that's how royalties and advances work. Um, I noted single accounting. I'm actually going to go into that later. Um, but I also have film, TV, and merchandise rights that are part of my contract. Um, that's something that if I were to sell those rights, I can make additional income. Now, have I done that? No. But um, I know that that is on the table in the future. Um, and it's, it's a nice thing to have. So feel free to ask questions about my personal book deal, book deals in general, making money in publishing. Um, I'm happy to talk about any of that. In addition, I didn't mention this, but I did sell a short story to UNICEF. Um, that will be coming out, you know, in a few months. And um, I collected a, like, a small sum of money and it was, you know, a fun project, but something that paid enough that, um, you know, it'll buy groceries for a few weeks. Uh, Ruth, you asked, may I ask what single accounting is? Um, yes, you may. And I'm going to talk about that at the end of the presentation. So just bear with me here and I, I promise I will get to that. But any other questions, feel free to throw them in the chat, like I mentioned. So let's move on to investing. Um, you know, earning is obviously, I think, the central pillar because if we don't earn any money, we can't invest any money. But once we do have that money, it's important that we do invest it. And I'm going to break down why. So 
there are four reasons that I list here. There are so many more, but um, the central thing is that money simply loses value each year. Um, you may not know this, but if you have a bunch of cash under your bed, um, you know, the kind of traditional way, um, that money will lose value each year. Usually about two to 3% is what the U S gives as a figure because of inflation. Um, however, it could be more, you know, in Lebanon, my native country, uh, the money lost value by a factor of 10, you know, uh, overnight it went from being valued at, you know, 1500 Lebanese pounds to the dollar to 10,000 Lebanese pounds to the dollar. And the folks, yeah, it's, it's hyperinflation and, and folks lost a ton of money. They lost their life savings. And so not having that money invested and just sitting around is really dangerous. And once you start thinking about it that way, you kind of understand the urgency and the need to invest. Um, another reason is passive income. Passive income is kind of what I described a little bit in real estate, where if you, for example, buy a house and you rent it out, um, you're hopefully making more money than what you're paying um, in terms of mortgage and other expenses. And so you're actually earning more money because of the investment that you made. You know, that money otherwise will be sitting in a bank. So it's it was a worthy investment to invest in a house. And not only that, the house can grow in value at a, at a rate higher than, um, you know, money can. And actually, um, because we know that money now loses value to inflation um, and a house will tend to appreciate over time, it is a better investment. Your money is actually going somewhere. It's growing. The third reason is diversification. So I talked about diversification of income streams, but diversification of investments is so critical. So when I talk about emergency funds, that money is typically just being uh, put into a bank account uh, for use whenever you need it, whenever you have an emergency. And so that money is going to lose value year over year generally, unless interest rates are favorable. Right now in the United States, they are not. There's low interest rates at banks, and so that money will lose value. However, it is for emergencies. The rest of your money, you should invest, you know, whether that's real estate, whether that's stocks, whether that's bonds, whether that's another place. And we'll talk about some of those investment vehicles in a second. Uh, being di diversified means that you are resilient. So if one of those um, investments fails, um, and, you know, I tend to shy towards safe investments, but if one of those investments fails, I know that I have other investments that can protect my money. The fourth reason, the reason I like want to scream from the rooftops is compound interest. One, this has to do with how long you invest your money. So a lot of investments, you know, actually the percentage by which they're going to grow. For example, stocks also called equities will grow. Generally speaking, five to 7%, five to 10% actually um, over the life of of the time in which you've invested it. As long as you don't pull that money out, it's gonna grow. Um, the longer you keep your money in, like the stock market, for example, or real estate, um, not only will that investment grow, it will grow in a way that's compounding. So it's not linear, it's actually exponential in growth. And I think that this tweet from my friend, Jesse, um, who runs a blog called The Best Interest, really sums it up. Um, you know, $1,000 a month invested from age 22 to 30, um, you know, you invest nothing else from 30 to 60 for those 30 years. You've invested for eight years and you stop investing for the other 30 years. You keep your money in the market and you assume 10% annual growth. You have 2.5 million. Now, obviously, this is a best case scenario, but you will have a very large sum of money versus $1,000 a month invested from age 30 to 60, 10% annual growth. Um, you'll have 2.1 million. So you'll have less money. Um, and that's the power of compound interest because you've left your money in your investments for a longer period of time, right? 38 years versus um, you're, you're investing for 30 years. That's, that's what compound interest can do. I would say, hey, look into this more because it's really interesting and it's really motivating. Now we had a, a, a message in the chat. It's hard to see investing is worth it when you have, say, $50 of spare money a month, not $1,000. Um, you know, yes, it can feel that way. But trust me, even $50 a month invested into, you know, a safe investment, 
making, you know, like 5%, 3 to 5%, just throwing out a number, um, is going to get you to a much better place. Um, that money can be enough to buy a car, put a down payment on a house, um, you know, in a few years. And being disciplined about investing that much is going to help you um, reach your financial goals quicker. So I, I, I know a lot of folks who can be dissuaded, like, hey, I don't, I barely make ends meet. I have like, you know, 100 bucks a month that I can invest. Why would I even bother? Trust me, it does add up. It really does. And, and you know, just to take this example that we have from the tweet, imagine $100 a month invested. Well, that's going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars by the time you're 60, um, which is going to be like a really, you know, nice thing to have in your back pocket should you need the money um, for whatever reason, medical expenses or, um, you know, loans or, or, or whatever you want to do with that money. Um, just being able to have that in your back pocket is going to set you up um, to be in a better place financially than you would have otherwise been. Nora said, um, do you have to invest large amounts of money or can it be worth it to invest closer to like $20 a month? You know, just like I said, um, you know, anything you can invest each month, I used to do like $20 a month. Um, and that money has since grown. So, um, as long, as long as you keep your money invested, when you invest in stocks, when you invest in anything, typically when you're, taking money out, putting it back in, that's where you run into transaction costs. So you want to avoid um, kind of being a, a frequent dipper. And that's why it's important to keep an emergency fund. So should you need the money, you don't take it out of those investments, you take it out of your emergency fund, which is readily available. That's what we call liquid assets, right? Something that you can touch whenever you need to versus illiquid assets, like a house where it's a little harder to um, get rid of. Maya, asked what types of stocks are safest. Um, I'll get into that actually. I'll get into that very soon. So um, real quick, accounts that you need. Um, checking account, right? That's where I advise you put your um, emergency fund. I like checking accounts because you know you get a debit card and you can withdraw money from an ATM whenever you need it. So um, I would not advise putting your entire life savings into a checking account. Usually the interest rates and the return is abysmal. You actually end up losing money again due to inflation. But it's important to have one. It's important to have a, a way to easily access your money. Retirement accounts. Now, retirement accounts are investment vehicles. Typically with retirement accounts, you invest it and the government says, hey, you're not supposed to touch that money until you are retired, obviously, right? Um, so just be cautious when you invest in these accounts, you're not touching that money for years. And if you do, I mean, you might pay a small penalty. Uh, it's not, it's not really going to kill you, but I think that it's better overall to leave that money in. Now, the three retirement accounts that I think anybody needs are a Roth IRA, which is an investment vehicle that allows you to invest $6,000 a year into. So if you, after factoring in, what you earn in knocking out expenses, you have $6,000 left over, invest that money into a Roth IRA. Um, the, gov the, the benefit of that is that the government will not tax that money. It will not tax the, the gains, rather, on that money. So often when your investments make gains, that's taxed by the government. Um, in these retirement vehicles, it will not be taxed. That's a huge advantage. That can be hundreds of thousands of dollars over, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. It could be thousands of dollars. And, and even just that is worth um, investing in these accounts. I, I try to max out my Roth IRA every year as a principal. Um, the 401k is typically for us um, salaried individuals, though um, after my book deal, I opened a self-employed 401k. And that's just another retirement account that allows me to invest in certain funds um, that the, you know, the government does not tax until you retire. So being able to, again, taxes can vary from, we'll talk about this, but you know, from 20 to 35%. Um, so being able to save that percentage of money um, without having to pay it is going to do wonders for, you know, growth of your investments. Health savings account is another type of retirement account. And what, what it is, is you put a, a smaller amount of money into an account and this account will grow 
uh, because you're investing, but the what you use this account for are health related expenses. So you can't necessarily use them for um, to buy a new Lamborghini. It's it's not allowed. Um, I think unless you reach a certain age level, then you actually can. But generally speaking, that that money is for health related expenses. Those are three retirement accounts. I would advise everybody to 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 explore um, if not open. Now. Credit card accounts, I think everybody needs because you need credit cards to build credit and building credit and having good credit is going to be important as I had already discussed. So make sure you have a credit card um, account that you open that, um, you know, this is not included here, but that has a low fee if you can't afford a high fee. If you can, typically, you know, okay, get one that you can afford a high fee credit card for. But um, find one that does not charge a yearly fee. Um, find one that earns points on purchases Another advantage of credit cards is that you can track expenses with them. So if you're trying to figure out your budget, well, credit cards um, have really nice statements that you can access. Um, you know, each month they come out, and so it's a it's a tool that I use for taxes as well as for seeing okay, how much did I spend in a month, um, and then that will allow me to determine okay, um, what do I need to make because this is my spending. I try to put everything on a credit card personally just because of the points, as I mentioned, that I earn, right? And then perks. Um, credit cards have pretty neat perks these days, actually. Um, I have one credit card that actually gives me cell phone protection, like of all things. And it has no annual fee. Um, just by holding this credit card, um, I you know, am covered if I break my cell phone. Like they'll help me replace it. They'll give me money, like a few hundred bucks, which is amazing. So look into those perks because I think credit and credit cards and things like this tend to scare folks. But if you understand and have the financial discipline um, not to overload yourself with debt from credit cards and to pay things off right away, then you can actually tap into some really amazing benefits. And I think that that's something that's overlooked and um, definitely shouldn't be. So those are a few accounts that you need, right? Retirement accounts, credit card accounts, and a checking account for your emergency fund and, and, and money that you need to access on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we talk about stocks, I'm going to try and answer this question here in this context of taxable versus non-taxable, Maya. I think that the safest stocks, Bruce, you asked this is superb. Will it be available as a recording? Um, I believe it will. Um, I think Dream Foundry is going to post this later. But um, when it comes to stocks that are safer versus not safe, I think that you got to think about the company that you're investing in or the type of equity that you're investing in. What I recommend is actually not to invest in any individual company stock. Um, I've heard individuals say, well, this company has been around for hundreds of years. I'm going to invest in this company uh, because it's safe. And yes, generally those companies are safer than a company that's, you know, just debuted in the stock market and has no history and we don't know where it's going to go in a year. Yes, those may be safer, Amaya, those older companies. However, what I invest in are called um, index funds. And what an index fund is, and I'm actually, I don't know if I have this on the slide to talk about later, but I'll just talk about it now. An index fund is the type of fund that essentially tracks a whole group of stocks. So think about if you go to a store and you say, I want to make a meal. Um, are you going to buy just like meatballs or just spaghetti? Or would you rather buy all the ingredients, put them in the basket together? Um, then you can make a more wholesome meal. The meal is diversified. The meal um, is, is generally more put together versus one key ingredient. You know, you can put all your money into Tesla or Apple or Google or one of these big companies and just say YOLO. You know, if they grow, um, then I'm making more money, I'm cashing in. But what if they don't? What if they fail? So I think the safest um, bet is are these funds, which track several companies. I like stocks. Um, I like a certain um, – and I can, I can actually post some specific – uh, names. I don't want to do that because I'm not a financial advisor and I feel like that's irresponsible. But look into investment um, opportunities around index funds. Um, Amy asked, are they the same as mutual funds? Yes, they're they're very similar to mutual funds. 
So um, look for these funds that track many stocks. Um, usually there's a total stock market fund and that's what I like to invest in because what that does is it tracks um, hundreds of companies um, across the stock market. So say Amazon fails, right? Everyone thinks Amazon is a super safe, um, safe investment, but who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. If Amazon fails, there are hundreds of other stocks being tracked by those investment accounts that can cover the fall so that it's, it's, it's not really um, as felt as strongly now. I used Amazon as, a, as an example, and if Amazon fails, I think the whole stock market is going to be sent for a shock. But just to give you an example, right, um, it tracks a whole bunch of companies. If one company goes down, other companies are there to soften the fall, and your investment is generally safe. That's why I like index funds. Warren Buffett actually recommends index funds now. Obviously, he's uh, pursued a different uh, avenue of investing. That's why he's one of the richest people in the world. But he says for general um, investing for everybody, index funds are the way to go. And it's true. It's been proven actually that index funds, um, any any type of fund that tracks the overall market will do better in the long run for an individual than if you were just picking stocks and saying, hey, based on my perception, I think that this is a better investment. So Maya, let me know if that creates more questions. Amy, I hope that that answered your question. Index funds are very similar to mutual funds. They're typically safer investments. Um, I think generally speaking, if you invest in more and the more you diversify, um, you are making your investments safer. And that's, that's, that rule will, will apply across the board always. Um, so that's why I invest in index funds. I use, um, and I'll talk about this later, but I use Fidelity or Vanguard. Those are the two biggest companies. I trust them. Um, and, and I try to make investing as easy as possible myself because I personally don't have time. Like I want to write books. I don't have time to, to worry about, you know, what am I going to invest in today, tomorrow, whatever. I, I know that these investments are safe. I can accept that I won't make, um, ridiculous, uh, percentage returns, but I know that I'm going to make a solid return. So taxable versus non-taxable investments, um, you know, it typically we're referring, like I made the distinction earlier, to the gains on the investments. You know, you might pay taxes on the money you earn before you invest it, but once you invest it, obviously the investment is going to grow in value. That growth may not be taxed, and that is valuable. That's going to be a big difference. And so taxable investments, just to give you a few examples, are real estate. Um, though I note that um, there are certain tax, you know, loopholes and things you can exploit such that real estate um, is not taxed as high, but real estate is taxed. I pay, a, you know, a, a semi-annual tax on my uh, condo that I own. Um, and it's, you know, it obviously I make more than what I have to pay in taxes, but it's still a tax I have to pay. So understand that this is a taxable investment. Non-retirement brokerage accounts. So all a brokerage account is, is an account where you invest in stocks and equities and bonds. If it's not retirement, if it's not retirement fo focused, generally you are paying taxes on those gains. Now, does that mean you shouldn't invest in them? No, obviously um, invest in them, but I think it's more advantageous to invest first in your retirement accounts. And then if you have money left over, if you've maxed out those retirement accounts, invest in those non-retirement brokerage accounts. And then I threw in cryptocurrencies because cryptocurrencies is one of those weird subjects and people are saying it's going to revolutionize investing and, and, and the way our financial system works. And uh, great, you know, uh, it, it's very volatile. It's not it's not a safe investment. And that's just a fact. I, I invest in cryptocurrencies. A very small percentage of what I have is invested in, in cryptocurrencies because I don't want to take a huge risk. Um, but just acknowledge that those are they are taxable. The government will try and tax them, even though historically uh, it's been it's been an iffy situation. Non-taxable investments. Here's where things can get tricky, and I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible by breaking it down between post-tax and pre-tax. Now, what that means is post-tax, um, you earn money and you pay the tax on it, and then you invest it. That's all that means. You're paying the taxes, and then you invest the money. So the gains are not taxed. Pre-tax, and this generally um, is more geared towards folks working salary jobs, they'll be offered a 401k, and the money that they earn can be funneled into the 401k, 
without paying any taxes. That's called a traditional 401k. And that's pretty great. You know, you don't pay taxes on the money you earn. Um, obviously, there's a cap on how much you can invest in the 401k. The government doesn't want you to be able to invest unlimited amounts of money and just evade taxes altogether. Um, I believe currently it's 19500 for the 401k, which is a whole lot of money. I don't know many people who can invest that much in a year. Um, but that is the uh, pre-tax 401k. Um, if you don't work for a salary job, you can actually open what's called a traditional IRA as well, um, similar to a Roth IRA, which I suggested earlier. Um, but this is where you make money and you invest, um, I believe, six to 7,000, depending on how old you are, into this um, IRA. And um, you don't have to pay taxes on it up front. However, once you do draw the money out later in life, same for the 401k, you will have to pay uh, a tax on it. Um, so it's really a decision between am I paying taxes now on the money or am I paying just taxes later? Now, I personally prefer to pay taxes now on the money. And the only reason, and this is not advice, but the only reason I do it is for peace of mind so that later on I know I don't have a bill to pay because I don't like to have uh, you know, things that I have are hanging over my head like, hey, eventually I have to pay this bill or that bill. Um, if I have the means, I'm going to pay it off right now and know that I'm safe for the future. So that's the difference. One thing that I also want to mention is that when I talk about these IRAs or 401ks, um, people get confused because you don't just put money into them and it grows. Um, these are overarching accounts that you put money into. And once they're, the money's in there, you pick stocks within them. And you can, you know, obviously, like I mentioned, I invest in index funds within them. But, um, you know, you can invest in actual, like you can invest in Apple or you can invest in whatever within a, a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA or a 401k or even an HSA. Um, so that's an important distinction to remember is you, you are still investing in stocks and taking some risk, but you're doing it in an account that uh, may be tax advantaged, which comes with a benefit. Um, Beth said some people pay later because it'll probably be in the lower tax category. Um, that's true. That's absolutely true. And what that means is that if I'm making, just to throw out a number, um, this is not you know true, but just for the sake of an example, if I'm making a million bucks right today, my tax bill is going to be higher than if at the time of retirement, I'm making $40,000, right? So I'm going to defer my taxes to later because I know I'm going to have a lower tax bill later than right now. And therefore, I'm going to do one of those um, pre-tax accounts because I don't, I don't pay taxes on it right now. Um, now, I don't make that much money right now, and I don't know if I'm going to make less money when I retire. And because I don't know, um, you know, I, I would love to make more money when I retire than I do now. Um, I'm going to pay the money up front. And again, it's because it's psychologically, like I don't, I don't like to have the bill hanging over my head. But to Beth's point, that is why folks defer paying taxes until later, because they think that, when they're retiring, generally speaking, you may have a lower tax bill because you're earning less money. You're not working anymore. So that is the distinction between taxable and non-taxable. Um, and, I, and I go into additional investments as well. I think this is important. Um, let's see how I'm doing on time, actually. Okay. So we've we've been talking for almost an hour here, which is amazing. It, time just flew by, but I'll, I'll try and continue to power through here. Um, additional investments, real estate. I already mentioned that um, there are ways to make money and make this advantageous. Um, I, I, I know FHA loans, which are ways to get into real estate. Um, that stands for um, first time buyer loans, essentially. Um, you, because it's your first residence, um, the government will subsidize um, the amount they need to put down in order to, to take out a mortgage on a house. And so that's great for a first-time home buyer. If you want to buy a home, if you want to get into that, that's what I did personally. And um, I think that's a great thing to take advantage of. And again, it only works for your first house. Um, but, you know, having a house is is a great predictor of um, future success and future wealth, apparently. And so um, it can be a great uh, investment tool. House hacking is when you actually buy a house. And obviously, there are many rooms in a house. So you rent out a couple of rooms to cover the costs of owning the house. That's house hacking. And so you're essentially living for free. 
which is a, a pretty neat proposition. Obviously, you have to be able to tolerate roommates, but I think that, um, you know, for someone like myself who's finally been with roommates, generally speaking, um, it's a, it, I'd rather, you know, live for free than having to, you know, pay for living. And again, you own a house, so it's appreciating in value as well. And then I mentioned cash flow and appreciation. That's just, you know, when you rent out a house, when you rent out real estate, um, you're hopefully making money above your expenses. That's called cash flow. Um, and also, hopefully, your investment, your house is increasing in value year over year. Generally speaking, houses do increase in value um, depending on the area and where you are. Bonds are a safer investment than stocks. They are just another investment vehicle. You can buy bonds for companies and, and even from the government. Um, and they usually pay a really uh, a, a lower return, not necessarily a really low return, but just a lower return um, than stocks do. Um, I, I think it's better to invest in index funds um, and stocks than it is to invest in bonds. But if you really want a super safe investment, bonds are the way to go. Um, you know exactly how much you're going to get in terms of return year over year. Um, and it's, it's super safe. And then in, invest in your education. You know, this is kind of sappy, but... Um, I think going to college was a good investment for myself personally. Um, I know friends who um, decided to go to coding boot camps and learn how to code, and um, they got great jobs because of that. Um, I know writers who went to writing workshops and they became better writers and eventually sold books. So investing in our own education, um, in a sense, you all, by listening to this talk, are investing in your education for free, which is awesome. Thank you, Dream Foundry, for offering this. Um, but it's, it's that, that does pay, um, a really good return. I think, I think continuing to grow and better ourselves. I know that every time I buy a book and I read it, I'm learning from the author a little bit, even though I myself am a published author, I don't think I, I've learned all that I, um, can. So invest in your education, like don't undersell that, um, you know, don't, you don't have to, you know, pay $70,000 a year in tuition to a, a university, but um, there are ways to invest in your education that are going to pay dividends over time. And um, that should not be um, undervalued. So kudos to all of you doing that right now. Now taxes. Okay. This is the part that scares uh, a lot of folks. Oh, Beth with the question, what kind of expenses can a freelance artist take off their taxes, workshops, reference materials. I'm going to get into that, Beth. That's a great question. We're going to talk about expenses when it comes to taxes, and that's a really fun subject, actually. Um, but taxes are important because a lot of people assume that you know taxes are a set thing and everyone has to pay them and, and, and there's nothing you can do in terms of variability. Um, but that's not true. Um, as I just mentioned, there are expenses that you can list on your taxes to lower your tax bill. There are things that we can do. We will dive into some of those fun little, um, you know, not necessarily loopholes, but um, very legal means of uh, paying less taxes. And um, I think it's important to understand how we pay taxes because yes, we can pay an, account, uh, an accountant to do it for us every year. Um, however, um, being able to understand the taxes that we pay will help us understand our overall financial health. So I do want to dive into this a little bit here. Now, quarterly versus annual, um, there, there are quarterly taxes that are paid at the end of, like I, like I said, every quarter. Um, and there's an annual tax that is paid um, April 15th. And in my blog post, I actually go into the specific dates and I gave you a lot more on this. But um, what and when you pay depends on if you're a freelance or a salaried worker. Um, salary workers only have to pay the annual tax. Um, your company is keeping all your data. They will give you all of it back in the form of a W-2, which is just a form that tells you, hey, this is how much uh, you've paid in taxes to the government from each paycheck. Um, this is how much you um, have made in a year. You input that data or give it to an accountant. Um, and then, you know, you it, the software that you're using or your accountant will tell you, okay, this is what you owe. Um, or this is what you're going to get actually back in the form of a return. Um, so um, you only, if you're salaried, pay an annual tax. Now, freelancers and self-employed creatives have to file um, both. So um, what that means is if you are self-employed, you must file quarterly taxes on top of um, an annual tax return. 
so there's five events that you're having to you know file taxes and or pay taxes note that when i talk about those five events you're only having to pay taxes if you've earned money um, in that quarter so while you have to file annually um, you only have to file quarterly taxes if you've actually earned money for example i george rage sold a book in the first quarter of 2020 uh, or rather 2021 i'm going to report that income in quarter one of 2021 i did not sell a book in quarter two of 2021 therefore um, i made no income in quarter two of 2021 and i'm not gonna have to file anything um, now when i do my annual filing i'll have to go back and say okay this is what i made you know holistically in the year but um, just know that you only have to file quarterly taxes if you earn money in that quarter. So nice little tidbit there. Um, I had a second note that I can't really see here. Let me see if I can pull that up. Maybe not. No, I cannot. Just fine. The slide deck will be available after the presentation. So here, here's the schedule. Um, that I have on the, on the uh, blog post. Um, should you want it for reference, annual taxes are due on April 15th. We all know and may have heard April 15th is tax day. Um, so that's, that's you know, a, a day to celebrate clearly. No, we dread it. We don't like to file. It, it's not fun to file taxes. If you if you have fun filing taxes, then I'm, I'm scared of you. <laughs> um, so Beth asked, does, does this freelance tax apply to households? Um, yeah, um, it does. I mean, any anyone who earns, um, who's a freelancer and, uh, you know, earns um, money in a quarter has to pay uh, tax in that quarter. Um, and that tax will vary depending on where you live. So, um, you know, it doesn't matter if you're, how you're filing it, you know, how many dependents you have, um, you will have to pay taxes if you make self-employed income or freelance income each quarter. Um, I also provide the quarter, um, one, two, three, and four tax dates here. We can just kind of skip through that. Um, and you can reference that whenever you want. It's easily accessible online as well. Um, but, you know, a tip that I like to use, um, this is something that I myself did, is um, you use a certified public accountant, a CPA, the first time. You know, these are tax professionals. It's their job to file taxes. Study what they do. Take notes. You know, I, I jotted down, like, what forms they use, um, you know, what deductions they uh, put down. And I learned from my CPA that I used. And then um, you can start to actually pay these taxes on your own. And so I pay my own quarterly taxes. I still use a CPA for my annual filing, but I think that, um, generally speaking, the quarterly filings, and anyone can learn to do. Now we're going to get back to Beth's question about what can you deduct? What can freelancers deduct? So um, deducting is something that um, can be done for freelancers more so than salaried workers. With salaried workers, your expenses um, are typically tied to the company and the company usually covers, you know, your your laptop and and whatnot and all this and all, all these things that they provide you so you can do your job and earn your money. But when you're a freelancer, you have to buy all that stuff yourself and you can actually deduct, deduct that. The government will allow you to um, say, hey, I bought a new laptop this year. Um, I'm, you know, that thousand bucks, I don't, you know, that's money I spent on my job and why I, I don't want to pay taxes on that. And the government will say, okay, so I'm going to give an example of myself, um, as I like to do, um, just to kind of help you get an understanding of things. Um, you may be able to duct depending on what your craft is, what your job is. Um, these are things that I've deducted, um, and I plan to continue to deduct. You know, so uh, what I used to write, um, if I bought it in that year, um, I will deduct it. So if I bought a cell phone, um, if I bought a tablet, if I bought a laptop, um, that is what I used to write. I'm going to deduct it in my taxes. Um, writing software, Microsoft Office Suite, Scrivener, whatever you use, you can deduct that because you are needing that software in order to do your job, to make your income. Books, you can make an easy argument that books are education. Like I mentioned previously, when you're investing in your education, um, you know, you can deduct that as an author. Um, it's research, it's education, um, it's 
part of your promotion, um, you know, books can be deducted. So buy books. Don't buy too many, though. But actually buy as many as you want, as long as you can deduct them, as long as you can afford it. Uh, a great investment. Um, you know, part of my mortgage um, when I was, and this only applies to me if I'm living in the house that I own, right? Um, if you're living in the house that you own and you write in that house, technically you are working in your office, right? So you can deduct a part of your mortgage and um, an investment and a tax professional will know more about that. Um, how much at least you can deduct, but you can deduct a part of it for taxes. And that's really great. Um, Kayla asked, so is rent not deductible um, if you work from home? Um, to be honest, Kayla, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I would ask a tax professional. It might be deductible, but I have not heard of someone deducting their rent. So I'm not quite sure if you can do that. But um, you can deduct the accountant's fee. So when Kayla, you go and ask the accountant, hey, is my rent deductible? Um, you can deduct the fee that they charge you to ask that question. So, um, you know, when I asked my accountant to do my annual filings, um, I deduct what they charge me in taxes as well. So um, it's a weird little, um, you know, US system thing, but it's an extra deduction. I'm going to take it. Um, going out to eat with writing friends. Um, obviously, this is a very broad topic of who you just define as writing friends, but, you know, business meetings, things like that, large companies will deduct. Um, and therefore, you as your own uh, company um, can deduct business meals, what you qualify to be business meals. Obviously, don't go overboard and take advantage of this, but within reason, you can deduct those meals. Again, in the same vein, trips you take abroad or writing retreats can be deducted. It's part of your education. It's part of your uh, career as a writer. So, you know, I went to Lebanon, like I mentioned, I go to Lebanon uh, pretty frequently because I'm a Lebanese American author. Um, and I look at that as research, you know, I'm brushing up on my Arabic. Um, and I'll, I'll actually touch upon that down below in this list. I'm seeing new areas that I can incorporate into my books and, and often end up do being incorporated in my books. And therefore that trip um, has meaning to my career. And so I deduct it. Um, Arabic lessons um, to stay sharp. You know, I, I was born speak in a, you know Arabic with my first language. Um, however, I speak English as I'm doing now, um, mostly in my day-to-day -day life. And so I got to brush up. And so the Duolingo yearly subscription um, is something that I'm going to deduct because I need it and, and Arabic finds its way into my books. And to stay sharp in my Arabic, I need to pay for that subscription. Um, and then lastly, gas mileage. Um, you know, if I'm traveling to writing events or, um, you know, traveling to a writing retreat, um, that mileage can be deduct deducted. Um, so depending on what your craft is, um, there are a lot of deductions that you can take um, related to that craft. And again, being able to tell that story of how it ties in is important. And a, a way you keep track of those expenses, kind of hearkening back, if you're not you know, tracking everything and, and setting a budget and, and recording all your expenses is by using those credit card or bank statements. So that's why I like using a credit card. It's because I can, you know, at the end of the year, go back and see my statements and say, all right, this is what I spent on. Oh, this is for writing. I'm actually going to deduct that. So it's a nice little hack there. Tax tips, get a good accountant. You know, accountants can um, really educate you. They can, um, they, they might know tricks that they can use to get you um, lower tax bills and or get you the maximum returns that you can have. Um, and I, I found that um, I, I've had good accountants and bad accountants, and it makes a big difference. So make so vet your accountant, um, check out their reviews online, and ask around, and get yourself a good one. It's, it's hard to, you know, you never know who you might end up with. So it's important to know and trust the person you're working with because it's important. Donate. Donating can be deducted from your taxes. Um, there is there is an annual amount um, that you can donate, and that is money that you don't have to pay for in taxes. And so I'd rather have a lot of my money going to donations and, and charitable causes um, rather than having to give it to the government. 
that's just a personal preference. I like to donate um, each year. Um, there's a set amount that I donate depending on the causes. And, um, you know, it, it's something that you can do. It's like a life hack, right? Um, you're, you're giving to a good cause, you're doing something fantastic, and you're paying less tax as a result of that. Move to a low tax state. Now, um, there are states, um, and again, this is US specific, however, to, to put it in a global perspective, um, there are countries that charge less taxes than others. And sometimes they charge less taxes on investments or on cryptocurrency or on real estate or on whatever. And so do your research and figure out um, whether that's a country or if you're living in the US, a state um, that charges less tax than others. Um, you know, Florida, just to throw out an example, I don't live in Florida, but Florida has no state income tax. I'm currently speaking to you from Massachusetts and Massachusetts has uh, an income tax over 5%. Now that is on top of the federal income tax that you pay. And the federal income tax is not really something that you can play around with. It's determined with by how much you make, not where you live. So no matter where you are in the States, you will have to pay federal income tax. But what you can play with is the state income tax, depending on where you live. So say you make $100,000 in a year, um, that can be the difference between paying uh, zero state income tax and paying over five thousand dollars and 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 much more actually in state income tax. So um, that's a consideration. And if you're mostly freelance, it's a it's an important one to take. Um, Nora made the fantastic point that although sometimes a state will have no um, state income tax but a high sales tax, um, and she mentioned Washington, um, but there are states that actually have really high property tax as well. Um, like New Hampshire, that have no state income tax. So again, keep that in mind. Um, look at all your facts. Generally speaking, if you live a really frugal lifestyle, um, you can find ways to play around with that so that it's really advantageous to you that you live in certain states. And then the last one is max out those tax deferred retirement accounts that I talked about. So that would be the pre-tax accounts. So the traditional 401k, um, for example, um, that's what I have. And I throw money into that for my salaried income. And that lowers my tax bill because I'm not paying taxes on that today. I'm paying taxes on that tomorrow. Or when I say tomorrow, I mean when I retire. Um, so um, I use that as a means to pay lower taxes um, in the day. And it's totally legal. And it's what, it's what it's there for, right? The government wants you to invest for your retirement. And so invest in those retirement accounts and take advantage of that. So now we get into kind of like a, a little bit of the dessert here, book deal secrets. I have spilled um, some of the details uh, about my book deal, but I want to give you um, some things that, you know, once you all get your own um, contracts, whether that's what, when it comes to books or um, whatever your art may be, um, you know what to do. So in this slide, you'll see a couple pictures of my uh, book deal announcements. Um, and you may see some verbiage there um, that I will help break down in the next couple slides. So first things first, if you want to go into traditional publishing, not self-publishing, but traditional publishing, which means you go work with a big publisher and they put out your book, um, you should have an agent. And for more reasons than one, right? Um, but when it comes to finance, agents should take no more than 15% of your cut. Um, there are what we call smagents, which are uh, folks kind of posing as agents or trying to do agent related things, but they're not official agents. And they may say, hey, you know, pay me a fee up front. Um, I'll read your work um, and I'll help you get a book deal. That is something I would shy away from. Um, get a traditional agent who charges you a 15% commission because um, they are incentivized then to sell your book and to work with you to make your book marketable and um, to give you the best possible book deal. And that's how they make their money. Um, your agent also will take your novel on submission to publishers. There are many publishers who will not look at novels who are not represented by an agent or will not look at the novels of authors who are not rather represented by agents. So make sure you have an agent and that opens up the opportunities in the world of possibilities for you um, in terms of who and what publisher you can go to. So um, it's really important to get an agent. I'm not going to go into details as to how to get an agent in this because it's about the finance 
around it, um, but it's important. Um, another thing, so say you have an agent, you go to publishers, and publishers are interested, congrats. Um, and more than one publisher is interested, double congrats, right? Um, you go to an auction. Um, so when more than one uh, publisher is interested um, in your book, they will bid on your book um, to buy it. So in my case, Harper Collins and Hachette, um, an imprint of Hachette, Little Brown, um, they wanted, you know, my book. I was I was lucky, and they went to auction, and that um, increased the advance that I got because they were fighting against each other and offering advances to try and beat the other one out. Um, and that's, you know, a really cool thing. And, and having a good agent um, is important because the agents are the ones who set that up. They, they, they hold the auction and they negotiate everything. Um, to the point of negotiations, book deals are negotiated following the acquisition of a book. So say Harper Collins told me, we want to offer you this much. I said, okay, that's, you know, that's, that's a great deal. Thank you. I will take that offer. Um, you then negotiate details of the book deal afterwards. You can negotiate at the time. You will be offered a contract and you can review it, but lawyers typically take their time um, finalizing the contracts months, weeks and months after uh, a book deal is agreed upon. So for me, I was not able to announce my book deal for months and months and months um, after I actually sold the book because my agents, lawyers, and the publisher's lawyers will were doing negotiations. Uh, around clauses and making sure everything was finalized and agreeable. So just a, some tidbits there about the finances. Um, some book deal basics. Now, advances versus royalties. I covered this already. But again, an advance is something they give you up front, and it's not free money. You have to earn out that advance in order to get royalties. That is the distinction between an advance and a royalty. Um, Royalties will differ based on the format and the medium, as I discussed before. So be sure that um, you know what you're getting based on what you're selling. And you can also negotiate those at the time of selling a book. Um, you know, I negotiated my royalties. Um, you know, it's not a major amount that you can move the needle, but it's, it's significant um, when you look at the big picture. Rights, foreign rights, TV movie rights, licensing and merchandise rights, those are things you can negotiate for. Um, to have, you know, I want to retain my foreign rights because yes, you can sell world rights to a book and you may see those uh, more common, but you can also, if I, because I sold English rights, um, now I can sell my foreign rights for additional income and that's fantastic. And I, I would love to get my book um, in as many markets as possible. So um, why not retain those rights? Um, if I can sell TV and movie rights, um, that's more income for me to get and potentially uh, more in the future if when I sell those rights and the, 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 my intellectual property, my book is made into a movie, you know, hypothetically speaking, um, that's more money in my pocket, right? And licensing and merchandise. I mean, George, I'll give an example. Um, George Lucas kept his uh, licensing and merchandise rights for Star Wars. Um, how much money do you think he made off of, off of that? Ridiculous sums. So um, obviously this is not every book is going to become so big that you can cash in on that licensing and merchandise rights, but um, you never know. And so try and retain as many rights as possible. Now, the question came up about single versus joint accounting in the future, and I'm going to break it down this way. Um, it's a very simple concept, but one that we don't really hear about. Um, joint accounting is when if you sell more than one book at once, your publisher will say, in order to earn out your advance, you have to earn it out for every book that you sell. So if I sold a three-book series and my advance was um, $100,000 broken up between three books, I have to set, earn out my advance for all three books in order to see royalties, any royalties. With single accounting, you're only accounting for each one book. So if I sold a trilogy for $100,000, the advance is broken up between those three books. If I earn out $33,000 for book one, then I'm seeing royalties for book one as it comes in. And I know that the first book of any series sells the most. That's just a fact. Um, so single accounting is generally better, and you should try and get single accounting versus joint accounting. There are some publishers that only offer joint accounting, and um, so if you want to go with them, you have to accept that. However, um, a lot of times you can actually negotiate that. Now, one more thing, marketing and lead titles. 
Um, marketing is something that, you know, not necessarily comes out of a negotiation, um, but you can generally, especially if you're in an auction, auction situation, um, ask what is the marketing budget or marketing plan going to look like for my book? Um, is my book a lead title? A lead title is, um, you know, typically a, a book, a title, right? That gets more marketing dollars spent on it because the publisher is relying more heavily on this book's success. So, um, you know, you can definitely ask, hey, um, what's my marketing budget? Am I going to be a lead title? Advocate for yourself um, when you're, you know, negotiating a publishing contract and they may give you an answer. And, and I've had friends who um, the publisher said, you know, this is your marketing plan. We want to give you a really robust, um, you know, marketing effort. And we're actually going to make you a lead title as well. And that's good to know up front. Um, you know, so that those are things to think about now. Again, we've gone over the hour, but we've covered a lot of ground, and I want to give my closing thoughts. Finance is is uh, an art and a science, um, similar to you know the creative passions that we pursue. Um, however, you know don't think too much about finance that you get um, worried and, and to the degree that you know it makes you double uh, or question um, what you want to do you know, with your passion, follow your passion. First and foremost, um, follow your passion and, and just do it. Don't think about the money. Um, it's, that's going to make for, you know, a more rich and fulfilling life, I think. Um, and it's really important. Now, um, having said that, reduce your expenses and invest, you know, as much as possible. Um, as you make more money over time, there's something called lifestyle creep where you spend more money as you make more money. Try and avoid that. Um, reduce your expenses as much as possible and, and and take that difference as you make more money and invest it. And, and that's going to set yourself yourself up for success in the future. Um, along those lines, be patient. Investments take time. Don't expect immediate returns. Um, things that advertise immediate returns um, are typically less safe. Um, over time, if you're patient, um, like with compounding interest, your investments will yield better results. Um, your writing will yield better results. Whatever art you do, as long as you're patient over time, will improve. Uh, same goes for finance. Um, so be patient with your investments, with your finances. Even if you don't make a lot now, um, just keep at it, work hard, and you may make more in the future. Um, keep that keep that broad mindset. Kayla, going to a question real quick. Kayla asked, would marketing cover things like the book cover? Um, how much influence do authors typically have for those kinds of things? Um, yes, Kayla, um, when, you, when I talk about marketing in my previous slide, that um, you can negotiate how much influence you have on your book title in the contract. Um, I have what's called first pass, which means I, I, get to, I have to okay the book cover before it goes out. So that's something that you can negotiate when it comes to uh, your contract, when it comes to marketing. So great question. That's, that's something that's really important, actually. Um, my fourth closing thought is should you want more information on this? Um, I mentioned earlier, I, I did a three-part series with my newsletter, uh, georgerage.substack.com. Um, subscribe or just check it out um, for more on the topics. And I, I try to put out something every week. And uh, whether it's philosophical or it's about finances or something like that, um, I try to be consistent and uh, offer the most value to you. You know, So let me know what you want to hear about. And um, you know, should you have any questions, feel free to um, also... Um, find me on my socials. I'm by George Rage. Um, you know, that's my handle at by George Rage on Instagram and Twitter. So I'm pretty active there. Um, feel free to say hello. I'll say hello back. And um, yeah, thank you all for attending this talk. I hope you took something out of it. Um, I really loved presenting it. Um, my dog is barking downstairs. So um, this is where I'm going to say peace. It was awesome. And I hope uh, to see you all uh, soon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>